Nickelodeon was starving for narrative drama television. They would end up grabbing three narrative shows during their 1981 season, and two of those shows were so closely linked that I have to wonder if Nickelodeon purchased the rights as part of a package deal. Buy one show, get another show free! Last time we talked about Adventures in Rainbow Country, a 1970 program created by William Davidson about two kids having adventures in the Canadian wilderness. Today, we're talking about Matt and Jenny, a 1979 program created by William Davidson about two kids having adventures in the Canadian wilderness. I don't know if Davidson ever intended to be the Adventures in the Canadian Wilderness guy. As I mentioned in my previous episode, he had first tried to make it as a filmmaker in the late 1950s, despite the fact that there really wasn't a Canadian film industry at the time. His films, Now That April's Here and Ivy League Killers, both released in 1958, were not wilderness adventures, but inner-city young adult dramas set in Toronto. After those films failed to make money, Davidson found himself working in children's television, helping produce segments for the 1961 Canadian's children's program Razzle Dazzle. The show would have short adventure serials with a puppet show framing device, and one of those serials was The Forest Rangers, about a forest ranger station run by kids. The serials proved popular enough to be spun off into their own proper television show, and Davidson was along for the ride, starting his wilderness adventure career. But after producing The Forest Rangers and Adventures in Rainbow Country, Davidson took a break from the genre. Enough of this filming in our backyard stuff. Let's go big. Let's go science fiction big. Davidson's next major project was as one of the executive producers of 1973's The Star Lost, a sweeping space epic about a starship with segmented biodomes where isolated crew members have developed their own societies. Think the vaults in the Fallout video games, only in space. This show was a pretty big deal. The concept was developed by Harlan Ellison. It was going to have some of the most advanced special effects ever put on television. I actually watched this show years ago, and, well, if you Google The Star Lost, the fourth result is an article titled, Is The Star Lost the Worst Science Fiction Series Ever Made? Yeah, it was bad. Flatly acted, those special effects didn't actually work due to extreme budget cuts, and Ellison tried to distance himself from the project by using a pseudonym. Ellison would end up recounting his experience this show in the essay, Somehow I Don't Think We're in Kansas, Toto. I sat in the Four Seasons Motel in Toronto in company with a man named Bill Davidson, who had been hired as the producer even though he knew nothing about science fiction and seemed thoroughly confused by the show bible, and interviewed dozens of writers from 9am till 7pm. Unfortunately, because of the nature of Canadian TV, which is vastly different from American TV, they had virtually no experience writing episodic drama as we know it, but they were willing to work their hearts out to do good scripts. We knew there would be massive rewrite problems, but I was willing to work with the writers, because they were energetic and anxious to learn. Unfortunately, such was not the case with Davidson and the money men from 20th, NBC, Glenn Warren, and the CTV, who were revamping and altering arrangements daily, in a sensation imitation of the mad caucus race in Alice in Wonderland. Yeah, Ellison isn't too kind to Davidson in this essay, recounting last-minute phone calls, demanding story changes, and general chaotic management, and when Ellison wanted to use the pen name Cord Wainer Bird to distance himself from the project, Ellison and Davidson got into a full-blown shouting match. The Star Lost was a flop, and by Ellison's account, a big reason for it would be Davidson working in a genre he had no business working in. After getting a firm smack, Davidson drifted back into his lane. He tried his hands at directing films again with 1975's Lions for Breakfast, about two brothers traveling the Canadian countryside by bus. The film didn't do too well critically or financially, but Davidson was back into wilderness adventure mode. 
He would dabble in science fiction one more time in producing the film H.G. Wells' The Shape of Things to Come, a low-budget Star Wars cash-in that had nothing to do with the actual book of the same name, but that was just a side gig as he prepared to make his big return to proper wilderness adventure children's television. Nearly a decade after Adventures in Rainbow Country, William Davidson created Matt and Jenny. Let's get out of here. Did you ever see anything as big as that bear? Never in my whole. <laughs> Also known as Matt and Jenny on the Wilderness Trail 1850, this is the story of two English children, Matt and Jenny Tanner. A year ago, their father passed away, and the family decided to move to Canada to start fresh with their extended family, leaving behind their home, their friends, and their British accents. Hungry? Yeah, but we don't even have a penny. Well, maybe we can find something on the docks. But be careful! However, on the trip across the sea, Matt and Jenny's mother falls ill and dies, leaving the two orphans in a strange land. They do know they have relatives here, the rest of the Tanner family, but it seems that the Tanner family moved west about three months prior. The two kids have no choice but to follow the Tanner's trail, but they won't be doing it alone. Adam Karsten, a suave man of culture, was on the same ship as the kids, and feels bad that he couldn't do more to help their mother and so he agrees to watch over them until they find the Tanner family. Along the way, they meet a charming mountain man named Kit, who takes a liking to the kids, and since he happens to be going in the same direction, decides to tag along. Oh yeah, Adam and Kit are totally boyfriends, you can't tell me otherwise, OTP. And so Matt and Jenny and their two dads cross the Canadian wilderness, finding adventure along the way. Forest fires. Bears. Ever wanted to see a man get into a knife fight with a hawk? Despite the differences in plot and time period, comparisons to Adventure in Rainbow Country are still very apt. Both shows have two young leads accompanied by dynamic adult characters to help balance out the inexperienced child acting. Though the child actors who play Matt and Jenny, Derek Jones and Megan Follows respectively, are actually more expressive and have better screen presence than their Rainbow Country counterparts. You could believe that these two actually had a few acting classes. Megan Follows would end up having a rather substantial career, starring in the immensely popular 1985 Anne of Green Gables miniseries and its sequels, and she's been working non-stop ever since. She's the real deal. The trade-off here is that these two actors are a bit younger, 10 instead of 14, and while Rainbow Country let their young actors do their own stunts and get all roughed up, a bad idea to be sure, but that's what they did, no such allowances were allowed for these kids. The most mortal peril Matt and Jenny end up in is that they get lost sometimes. Matt and Jenny spend most episodes just chatting with the episode's guest star, while Adam and Kit go off to do the actual adventure stuff. There are episodes where Matt and Jenny have almost no presence at all, they're like luggage. But hey, at least one of the main leads is a girl this time. Jenny doesn't get a lot to do, but she's on equal footing with her brother, and there's a refreshing lack of, you can't do that, you're a girl, in this show. Interestingly, there is an active attempt to resent progressive ideas about race and gender within the show, with characters speaking up whenever prejudice shows up. Effectively, we get to see what the 1850 equivalent of woke is. It's a long hike for us, sir. On foot. And dangerous for the savage Indians. But we'll make it. Miss Tanner, if you're going to survive in the North American wilderness, you'd better start looking on Indians as your friends, not as your enemies. You're dressed like a boy, aren't you, miss? Well, we'll be doing a lot of hiking in the bush. Hiking in the bush? That's hardly sport for a young lady, is it? 
Leave her be. There'll be young women in the police force soon. You mark my words. <laughs> Over my dead body. Which is all well and good, but it's not enough to just say progressive things. You have to be able to present progressive ideas in the text. The show doesn't opt to approach issues of racism and sexism beyond this token dialogue, making it a problem of show don't tell. In comparison, Adventures in Rainbow Country was flawed in a lot of areas, but on the subject of First Nations people at the very least, it had actual First Nations characters played by actual First Nations actors dealing with actual First Nations issues. You can say Indians are nice actually, but if you don't have any stories about that, then it's just words. When First Nation characters do show up, it's more in a Cowboys and Indians vein. They aren't seen as bad guys, but they're framed as weird others compared to Western society. And oh look, it's Iron Eyes Cody, the Italian guy who played the Native American who cried at litter on the highway in that one commercial. Okay, in fairness, Iron Eyes Cody was a big fat liar about his race and tried to live a lifestyle that wasn't his. This is less of a casting a white actor to play a non-white role thing and more of a Rachel Dolezal thing. But still, in the end, it's far less engaged and positive about these cultures than Rainbow Country was. Matt and Jenny kind of wishes it was a western. It plays with a lot of the same tropes. The high stakes poker game, the stagecoach robbery, the snake oil salesman. In the episode Devil's Gorge, Kit discovers a Scooby-Doo plot about a guy trying to scare people away from where he thinks Montezuma's treasure is buried. Which... what? Folklore says the treasure was buried near the Casa Grande ruins. That's in southern Arizona, dude. You're in Quebec. I think it might have gotten a little lost. As you can imagine, it's pretty hard to nail that American Western feel in a country that only has one small desert. But forget about it. As American Western, how is it as wilderness adventure? Well, it has a few things up on Rainbow Country. First, there's a lot more wildlife present. We get a lot of beauty shots of bears, wolves, beavers, birds. In fact, there's an episode called Wilderness Photographer dedicated to showing wildlife and their natural habitats. Already a point over the oddly empty forests of Rainbow Country. This show doesn't really get into survivalist techniques or camping etiquette, but it's not really about that stuff. It's just about getting from point A to point B and meeting a bunch of fun characters along the way. The characters are responding to adventure, not seeking it out like the kids in Rainbow Country, where this kind of information would have been appropriate. And no, Matt and Jenny doesn't have an evil clown episode. It does have a clown, and for some people that's enough. Matt and Jenny is altogether a more consistent show than Rainbow Country. It has higher production values, it looks nicer, the acting is better, the fact that it's a period piece adds to a lot of interest but it's actually a less interesting show for it. Avengers in Rainbow Country would go into weird places sometimes, and as such, the lows are a lot lower, and the highs are a lot higher in comparison. I think it's for this reason that, while neither show has received a home video release, Avengers in Rainbow Country has remained a syndication mainstay, while Matt and Jenny largely disappeared after its initial broadcast and two-year run on Nickelodeon. As for its place in Nickelodeon, Matt and Jenny and Adventures in Rainbow Country were almost always double billed together. And again, I ponder if this was part of a package deal. Seeing as Matt and Jenny was the newer show, only a couple years old by the time Nickelodeon picked it up, I would have to assume that it was the headliner and Rainbow Country was the bonus. But either way, Wilderness Adventures became a dominant genre for the channel basically overnight. Nickelodeon would tease the idea of continuing this trend with shows like Spirit Bay, which is not a Davidson joint, but very much in the same vein. But Nickelodeon never went through with it, limiting further Canadian wilderness adventures to the dunk drawer of special delivery. But for two short years, this was where you got your fiction, where you got your drama and action and excitement when you tuned into Nickelodeon. A bunch of kids bouncing around the Canadian brush. There's... More cynical things to build a channel around, I suppose. Nick, 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 Next time, we get back into the world of edutainment, and what better way to live up to Nickelodeon's early PBS that you pay for image than with an actual PBS show. 
Today's shout out goes to The Essential Ellison, a 50 year retrospective. Obviously, Harlan Ellison has nothing to do with Matt and Jenny or Nickelodeon in general, but the accounts of his time with Star Lost is the only real testimony of William Davidson's abilities as a producer. Important context for a very inconsistent creator. Obviously, if you're interested in the writings of Harlan Ellison, I can't recommend this book enough. Thank you all for watching. If you like what you see and you want more of it, you want to see it better and last longer, then perhaps consider subscribing to my Patreon. Every little bit helps, as does liking, sharing, subscribing, hitting that bell, and even following me on Twitter if you'd like to talk to me directly or keep up to date with what videos are coming soon. I'll see y'all next time.